give it another minute or so here. Let people jump on who have yet to jump on. I got my email sent out a little late today. So we'll let people, we'll give people another minute or two. Anybody got any uh, testimonies or questions or thoughts you'd like to share before while we're waiting on folks? You guys are talkative. Yeah. Noisy. Your lighting in there makes you look really pale and kind of yellow. I just thought you should know. Yeah. Yeah, I've struggled with lighting in here trying to figure it out, but I'm just going to have to be Kardashian tonight. <laughs> Welcome, Deb. Deb's always sitting in the dark. Did you mean Kardashian? Oh, what did I say? Kardashian? Yeah. Kim Kardashian? Yeah, no, not that Kardashian. <laughs> Star Trek Kardashian. Where they're gray looking. Anyway, my kids like Star Trek. Because I was thinking, are they that Kardashian's yellow? <laughs> Or fail? I don't think so. Just as long as you can see me, that's all that's necessary. All right. Well, let's get started here. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I'd like to just remind you, if you've got other people as you go about your life, that are that that need the message that we are teaching and talking about and living uh but aren't necessarily somebody that's going to show up on a sunday or whatever try to get them here send them the link this is private not to exclude people but to make it a safer place where we can really just talk about whatever we need to talk about and hash things out so it's not intended to be a, a private from others thing it's just to be private from people who have no business being in here um when when we started this i've well, been going for quite a while now I don't, I don't know how long maybe over a year um there were there was a big there was a a lot of popularity using zoom calls and for meetings and things like this for meetings and everybody would you know be having their teachings online like in meetings like this and they get all their groups together instead of getting together because of covid and um so people would have these meetings and put them on facebook like they put the link out there on facebook they put it out there on the website they put it everywhere and people uh who are bored because they were at home because of covid i guess i don't know they would um uh, they would they made a point to invade these Christian online meetings like this. And they would, uh, they would go in and take over and show all kinds of videos and images that nobody wants to see. And so, um, so it was wisdom to, to make it more private like this, but I, I, I don't want to ever exclude people that should be here. 
uh, because the point is to mass to to influence lots of people with the truth. It's a big job, and it takes it takes uh, a lot. It takes a lot of interface with people. You know, it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of people speaking the truth to a lot of other people. And so the more people that we can interface with this truth via, via my voice or your voice or whoever's, the better, because that's, that's the goal. That's the goal. So welcome, Claire. Uh, tonight, um, I want to, I want to, uh, talk about, I'm going to kind of talk about tongues a little bit, actually. Um, and sometimes I remember this story, uh, about Kenneth Hagin that goes, that, that I've heard. And because it's such a, it's such a good lesson for people who teach to uh, have and to think about. And this story is like this, you know, Kenneth Hagin was dying on his deathbed. And I think I even told part of that story last week or the week before, but he had this massive revelation of faith and believing the word and then began, you know, he himself got healed from his deathbed and then began this ministry that, um, you know, people call the word of faith, uh, which is just, you know, that actually that phrase is from the Bible, word of faith. Uh, this is the word of, or the word of faith, what, which we teach or something. Paul said it. So that was good. And his message was pretty pure and brought a lot of maturity to a lot of people, helped a lot of people understand the word of God and just faith. And um, that's where we get a lot of the faith teachings that even have even stuck around from the early 80s. A lot of the understanding on faith is because of that man and other men who got it from him. <clears throat> so that was primarily his message, uh, talking about faith. Faith for healing, faith for others, you know, faith to receive. Faith is just faith, you know. F you can't please God without faith, so it's pretty important. Faith, a faith that works and a faith that receives uh, when it asks and a faith that gets what it says. So he didn't major on he had this he had this wonderfully intimate relationship with God. He he loved the presence of God and he loved to minister to the Lord privately just in worship and he had a really vibrant flourishing personal communion with God. He didn't talk about it often, but he did. And like I said, he mostly taught on faith. So what you have then is a, a worldwide movement of preachers and teachers and ministers who come out of his, his teachings, out of his influence, out of his Bible college and start, you know, word of faith churches, thousands across the globe, thousands and thousands, um, and teaching faith. Faith for things, faith for finances, faith for whatever. And they they majored on faith because that's what they heard Brother Hagin ma major on faith. Although Brother Hagin's life was much more mature than just a faith teaching. But he didn't often teach outside of that realm of faith and that topic of faith. Well, all these other guys who came out from him. That's what they taught also, except they didn't have the depth and the maturity and the character and the even the revelation and the knowledge um, that caused Brother Hagen to be enduring, that caused him to be to have a very long lasting ministry, you know, that caused him to, you know, he never there was never any, um, you know, turbulence in his ministry he himself was just a strong charactered man and he never, uh, 
you know, he never had any issues in his own personal ministry concerning things that, you know, some ministers have issues with. And since he primarily taught on faith, those students will call them, those disciples of his only really taught on faith, but they didn't get the things in them that made Kenneth Hagin who he was. So they understood faith and could even operate in faith, but since they didn't become who he was or what he was, they operated in faith more carnally, <laughs> if I could say that. They operated in faith for things, and that's where the Word of Faith movement got a lot of bad rap because, I mean, you know, terms like this were coined, name it and claim it. Ever heard that? Blab it and grab it. I've heard, even heard name it and frame it. <laughs> Why? Because they were, they were, they came across as a very selfish or self-centered um, practice and a practice that we're teaching was causing people to be self-centered, you know, just for getting. Uh, for receiving, I, I should say, not forgetting, for getting, receiving. So faith for receiving for yourself, and it turned into like a very big prosperity message, right? And that's where the word of faith got it, kind of got its real bad rap is because it turned into largely prosperity. And really what happened is they didn't, they never became who he was because he didn't disciple them in much else but faith. And that wasn't on purpose. He didn't, he didn't see that coming. In fact, um, he saw the error happening in, in that word of faith movement. And he went in and, and called in all of these pastors of these word of faith churches and all these ministers who were teaching his message. And he called them in. This was like, I think this was early 90s. And um, to correct them and to tell, you know, to try to correct what he left out, <laughs> you know, and try to bring some soundness to the message that they were preaching so that it wasn't uh, a prosperity type gospel that they were preaching. And they got so angry. People got so angry with him for that. Um, a lot didn't come. They started kind of, you know, splitting from him and word of faith and some people threw big humongous fits and some of it was public. But the the lesson that um, the takeaway from that, that I think about often, which is why I started this little bunny trail, is that we can't just teach principles because people aren't going to live by those principles like you unless they become what you are. And that's the thing I always tell people. Um, when they come to me for discipleship, which is usually after they're in trouble, they, they wait until they're at the very end of the rope. They've hit the ground. They're on E, the gas is on E. And then they're like, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't really agree with everything you say, but God told me that I need what you have. <laughs> right. And so, um, the thing that I have to get across to them, remembering this story is I tell them, you must become like me. You must get around me and become like me. And that's not, you know, that's not, that doesn't have anything to do with me as a person. That, that means if you want to learn how to uh, become a blacksmith, you've got to live, eat, eat, breathe, sleep, blacksmithing, right? You've got to get, you got to get around that blacksmith and start to pick up stuff that he has spent years working on, but has just become a, so much a part of who he is that it's not something he thinks about anymore. He just he just hits his metal. He uses this hammer and doesn't realize why he uses this specific hammer for this specific heat or type of metal or whatever. I'm not a blacksmith. So, um, so that's the important thing. To remember is um, th that we have to remember that we are making people like us 
uh, whether we like it or not. And unless we divulge what brought us to this point, uh, we are leaving out the better part of the equipping. We're leaving out the better part of the picture. We're leaving out, uh, as Paul says, his ways. And that's what Paul, if you listen to our uh, training cycle at all, you'll hear me talk about this fairly often. Uh, whenever Paul, in all these churches that Paul started, and all these people that he discipled, he always, in all these leaders and elders and overseers that he had set up, he taught them all to teach the same thing, which were his ways. He called them my ways in Christ. Okay. And so it's the ways that are important, not just the, the teachings with one, two, three, four. You know, the word of God, it starts with the word of God, but you have to get the ways, right? You have to get the ways that make the man. Okay. And so um, to the, I, I went through that whole story and took a little time to tell that because tonight I want to tell you some ways. Okay. Some ways that um, I, I think people overlook too easily. They hear, um, you know, you can't make the mistake of hearing and hearing doesn't change you. Uh, what changes you is you as an act of your will, make a decision to obtain something for yourself. And hearing can help you understand or get on the right course. Um, you know, Paul said, Paul talked about a course. He said, I've run my course. We all have a course in this life. And there's parts of our course that are the same for everybody, but there's parts of our course that's going to be uniquely you because that's, you know, that's, you know, you're strong in an area. So you're going to start doing what works first. And that's going to lead you into a certain avenue and course and, you know, and God will work with you and work with uh, who, who you're ministering to and, and things like that. Uh, and so that just ends up being your course. You know, for example, my course largely is Southwest Missouri. I did not grow up here. I just happened to show up here out of an invitation, left and then came back. You know, there was never any God moments or God's writing on the wall or signs or voices to about Joplin or Southwest Missouri. This is just part of my course. I ended up here because a lot of it natural uh, means um, very little, little of it spiritual. Some it started spiritual, but mostly ended up natural. I mean, part of that is I got married and Haley's course is here. So, <laughs> all right, so let's jump into this. We're going to talk about, talk about a way and put it in context and bring in some of Paul's uh, speech uh, along this. Uh, but first of all, let me start out like this. Um, we are we are in a race, right? A race has a certain mentality, has a certain attitude, and it has a certain, um, um, you know, it, it, it lends, it, it causes you to constrain yourself in order to win or to win the race, right? Nobody enters a race just for, for fun. You know, a race is, if it's, if you're not racing to win, it's not a race. It's just a jog. It's just a, a, a recreation, but this race, we are to win it. And the race and the marathon that we're on, that we're uh, in to win is towards this mark of maturity, right? This is not new stuff. This is just me putting little guardrails and boundaries on what we're talking about tonight. The race that we're on is maturity. The, the finish line that you must keep in front of you is this finish line of maturity, of spiritual maturity. Okay. Jesus is our example of a mature son of God. When God said, uh, when God, um, through Paul wrote Romans 8, 29, we were predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. The image that God had in mind is of a full grown son. Um, there's this principle 
uh, alive in the New Testament. I'm not going to explain it, but those of you that have studied the word will understand it. We have we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. We have been adopted, we are being adopted, and we will be adopted. And so this final adoption is when we receive our immortal bodies at the return of Jesus Christ. And this adoption, this final adoption, it's not a separate adoption. It's just this process of finality that happens at the return of Jesus. This adoption is, in God's mind and in his word, is the intent of you're being adopted as a mature son. Right, that's that's where we go start to go against the grain of the modern church teaching, where everybody's kind of got this mentality: you pray a prayer to be saved. Okay, salvation. Jesus said, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." Salvation is a person. Salvation to us is being conformed to that person. That's really big. That's a big. That's a big good revelation to have. Okay. Because it doesn't matter how you start, but it does matter how you finish. Because salvation, people jumping in here, salvation has a has a has a goal. Salvation has a finish line. Salvation has a tape. You know, like the Olympics, they have the tape across the finish line and they lean forward to cross it. That that tape is maturity, spiritual maturity. That tape is growing up into him in every way. And that is what, and if you read back through Paul, then Colossians and Philippians and Ephesians, this is a constant theme and elsewhere as well, is a constant theme. He said, I'm I'm straining, I'm bearing down, I'm leaning forward into this. What is it that he's leaning forward into? He's leaning into and straining into a place, as the Weiss translation says, a place of spiritual maturity beyond which there is no progress, right? That is um, that is the goal, not only for your personal self, but all believers. And Paul even said that. He said, I, I uh, he said it multiple places. I'll just quote one. He said, I'm like a woman in childbirth until Christ be formed in, in, uh, in you. And I even put one of them uh, on our website. Uh, this is actually the one I wanted to quote just now. Um, it says, what does it say? Um, oh, no, 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 not on our website. Oh, it, it's, it's somewhere else. I've got projects on my, on my desktop here and I just went through it. But Paul says, that we may present every man mature in Christ. He said, I'm laboring, striving, toiling with all of this energy that's within me, that I might present every man mature in Christ. So Paul has a much different finish line, of course, and this is the Bible. I, I say Paul, he wrote it, but we're talking about the Word of God. This is his, this is Paul's gospel. This is uh it's best to even think about it this way. The epistles and Paul's epistles and the epistles of the New Testament are the continued teachings of Jesus Christ. Okay. Jesus said, I have much to say to you, but you cannot bear it. You're not ready for it. Okay. You couldn't handle it. You won't understand it without the spirit. And then once the spirit's poured out, then we have this massive amounts of revelation start flowing through the apostles. Um, and, even and this is why Paul calls it the mystery of the ages, which is the indwelling of the Spirit in us. So, all that is just to say the goal, the finish line is every man perfect. And that word perfect means mature. That's the Greek word teleos, and we'll bring it up here in a minute again. So, all of these epistles and in, in writings of the New Testament were written for that purpose. Okay. They were written for that purpose, to present every man perfect in Christ, to that every man would be adopted as a mature son, because that's God's goal. And this shouldn't be, you know, this is not like, you know, a, 
This is not something that you hope to reach by the end of your life. This is something that you reach and continue in in your life, right? You want to walk in maturity. You don't want to just reach maturity on the last day, right? <laughs> we want to walk in maturity. We want to become um, what he is, walking as he walked and conducting ourselves as he conducted himself. So everything that's written in the New Testament is for this goal. And there's other things that support and come around it, but this is the goal. This is the goal that Paul's bearing down on, and this is what he's telling everyone to teach his ways, which are in Christ, which are uh, there, because those are the things that the principles he follows to bring him to this goal. All right. So having understood what the goal is, we have to make every effort to come into that maturity. Okay. Now, if you don't play by the rules of the game, you're not going to cross that finish line of maturity. What I mean by that, Paul said that um, if you want to compete to win, you have to compete by the rules. What's he talking about? He's talking about there is no other path to maturity except through, for his gospel and the gospel that we see in the New Testament. So if we adopt some other mentality, some other principle in our life uh, with some maybe other goal, maybe you have the same goal, but you don't actually begin to adopt and do what Paul has set forth and others in the New Testament as their ways in Christ, then you will not arrive at the finish line. Okay? I didn't say you won't. Be with Jesus when he returns. <laughs> I'm talking about the goal, maturity. Okay? So, in other words, unless you gain understanding of these uh, of the word of God and begin to practice it, you will not reach maturity. You cannot reach maturity any other way. Okay? And and this is the this is like the biggest thing. This is like the biggest problem I see. And when, te when I teach, when I teach people, they hear it, they like it, they don't put it into practice. And that's, and Paul wrote about that. That's, that's the plague of us as humans. <laughs> we hear it, but we don't put it into practice. James talked about it. He said, you're like a man who looks at himself in the mirror and leaves and forgets what he saw, <laughs> forgets what he looks like. Okay. So for those of you who who have made a decision of your will to walk in him. Paul calls it walking in the spirit, living in the spirit, living by the spirit, walking as he walked. He calls it lots of different things. It means the same thing. Walking as a mature son. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on all those things because that's all of our teachings just about that. But I want to, uh, I want to, really just narrow in on uh, tongues here and talk about that and, and hopefully give you a correct new or better understanding of the role that tongues plays in maturity. Okay. So starting, starting out at first Corinthians 13, seven, first Corinthians 13, seven. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I'm going to read through verse 12. Verse 8, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. <clears throat> verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Verse 10. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even 
as I have been fully known. Okay. So this entire passage, and this is just a little part of a very, very longer, much longer passage. And Paul, uh, Paul is working with the Corinthians to try to bring them into maturity. They are the most carnal church on the planet. They have big problems. They have problems in the church that the world doesn't even have. And there's immorality and there's lots of, lots of things going on. Of course, they're coming out of a super pagan culture. So he's trying to bring them in maturity and talking to them about some of these ways uh, that he himself has come into maturity so that they can follow his ways into maturity as well. Uh, the first thing that's here uh, notable right here is he's, is he's talking about love. And love is directly correlated with speaking in tongues. Uh, let me say it like this. Um, the measure that you're influenced by the love of God is going to be directly uh, correlated to the measure of, I'll say, work that you do in tongues. Okay, This tongues is not the only method. I'm just talking about tongues tonight. But it's important to understand that love here is not just a, a random topic because he's talking about people coming into maturity. So love bears all things, believes. That word believe, by the way, is the same word in the Greek as Mark 11, 23 and 24. Whoever says to this mountain does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. And verse 24, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, you shall have them. That's the same word here, love believes. So he's making even a, uh, a connection between being influenced, filled. And when I say filled, that picture is um, immersed or baptized, like filled with rage. You're filled with love. You know, that means you're, you're extremely compelled and moved by love. That's what compassion is. And hopes in all things and endures all things. That endure, that that word endure in the Greek means to remain. And it's immovable. Okay. So then he and then he goes through this little list here. He's talking about some things. Love never ends, but some things are going to pass away. Tongues, knowledge. Um, and he talk, he says, We know in part and we prophesy in part. And this entire context is between an immature son. And a mature son. Okay. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And you probably heard some major demonic doctrine about that. Some people say the Bible is the perfect. Some people say Jesus is perfect, and he is, but that's not what this is talking about. When Jesus comes, the partial will pass away. That's not it. in context. That's not correct. In context, this is about a uh, uh, an immature son of God going to a mature state, okay? Uh, if that's true, then Paul should bring it up, which he does in the very next verse. So when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. That word perfect is teleos. It means a mature man, okay? So we're talking about a mature man. We're not talking about, you know, when they first printed the Bible, <laughs> the perfect Bible, when they put leather on it and give it a table of contents and some maps in the back. <clears throat> when I was a child, verse 11, here he goes, he's going to explain it. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And if you've got a strong concordance, the, word, the phrase childish ways is one word. And in the uh, King James concordance, Strong's concordance, it actually says immature Christian. So when I became a man, I gave up immature Christian ways, childish ways, okay? So, a child thinks like a child, speaks like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up those childish ways. Again, we're talking about ways in Christ, okay? When I was an immature son, I spoke like an immature son. I thought like an immature son, I reasoned. And that's a big one, reason like an immature son, okay? Verse 12, <clears throat> the last verse on this part. <clears throat> For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then 
face to face. For I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Read it again. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Paul's not changing the subject. He's not starting, uh, you know, talking about something different. He's still talking in context about becoming a mature man. All right. So for he's saying as a child, as an immature son, I see things dimly. And that, that word in the Greek is a mirror. Now, they did not have glass mirrors like we have. Back then, they were like polished metal. Have you ever looked into like a, not a, no, not stainless steel, but like a polished metal that it's, there's an abstractness to it. It's not a, it's not, I mean, like, it's not even, it's, it's barely a reflection. Like the water looking in a, a still pool of water would be a much better reflection than a, a, a mirror that they would use. That's, but that's what Paul's saying here. He's drawing uh, a comparison saying this is like trying to behold something or um, it's like trying to perceive detail in a mirror that cannot reflect accurately those details for me to see. Um, and that uses that word dimly or darkly. And, it, and we could even use this, I mean, just draw this whole picture if you've looked into a mirror, maybe even a great mirror like we have today, but it's dark, right? You're not going to be able to make out detail. You're not going to be able to see fully. You're not going to be able to make out uh, the, the level of the full picture, right? And that's what Paul is saying here. And let's draw this comparison before we move on. Let's draw this conclusion because renewing your mind is about drawing a new conclusion. The conclusion that Paul is drawing here with the Corinthians is that in order to become a mature man, a teleos man, a mature son of God, you're going to have to gain a revelation. You have to gain understanding and you're going to have to grow in that in order to see things clearly. What does he say? For now, I know in part then I shall know fully. Okay. What point does tongues pass away? What point is tongues no longer necessary? The gifts no longer necessary. You know, knowledge. What, what point is that no longer necessary? Right. It's no longer necessary in a mature son beyond which no further spiritual progress is available. That's why we see no record of Jesus speaking in tongues or operating in a gift. Or having a lack of knowledge. Because he's a mature son. So all of these things that we have. And we have been commanded. You know by Paul. Specifically tongues. These are some of his ways in Christ. Which God have has ordained. And some of these things are just super practical. But these are God ordained ways. Methods. Jesus said those who believe will speak in new tongues. And the purpose is to bring you into maturity. Now, as you go from knowing partially to knowing fully, to seeing dimly, to seeing accurately, you're going to have to exercise these ways, which we find in the Word of God, and make every effort to establish them in your life, to be constant and to endure in them. Now, one of these things that's causing, and I'm, I'm just going to say it, I'm just going to say it like this is the only thing. It may not be, but this is the big one, okay? One of these things that's causing you to see darkly is the influence of the flesh on your soul life, right? So... You read the Word of God and you wish you could get more understanding. Or you've got a favorite teacher and they have a great, they have profound revelations, but it seems like you got it when you heard it, but then you leave and you're like, I have no idea what he said, right? 
or you're listening to the Bible and you have no idea what they're talking about, <laughs> right? Or you you want to advance in strength and ability, uh, but there seems like there's something holding you back. You want to be able to speak clearly and articulate simply the accurate revelation of the Word of God that's going to bring salvation, healing, and deliverance, and maturity to people's lives. But you're not accurate. You're not able to convey that simply. Sometimes it's just a, a jumble in your mind, or sometimes there seems like there's nothing in your mind. What is that force that's causing what you want to perceive to be hazy? Does that make sense? When you want to look at the truth and get it in its accurate, rightly divided form, but there's a haze. What's that haze? That's looking into it darkly. You know, like. Um, have you ever been in this situation? I'm just trying to throw out examples. When you look at someone and you're like, there's something about them that's not quite right. That's looking darkly. That's seeing things dimly. See, what would Jesus do? He would see them and know them. <laughs> he would know everything about them. Isn't that what he did to, um, who was the guy underneath that tree? Um, I'm thinking about the chosen now when they, when they uh, acted that part out, he was an architect and he was under the tree. Was it Nathaniel or somebody like that? I don't remember who it was, but he, um, he, he, he knew him and he knew him that there was no guile in him. And he knew even earlier that day, the things that had transpired in his life. That's what it's like to walk in the mind of Christ. That's what it's like. And I'm going to say this. That's what it's like to crucify the flesh till it has no influence upon you. Okay. So we're talking about going from immaturity to maturity. You cannot go into maturity under the influence of the flesh. That's why Paul says those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. Zechariah. Good job, guys. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. And it's time to lay down. Yeah, y'all Bible scholars, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Okay. And I can tell you, I can tell you from experience that this is true. There is truth in this and there's a connection between you putting, but I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but all wants to come flooding out. There is a connection between you maturing and gaining fuller knowledge, fuller revelation, fuller understanding, gaining fuller operability of the Spirit through you. There's a direct correlation between that and you putting to death the influence of the flesh. Paul said it in elsewhere like this, put to death whatever is earthly in you. Okay, Paul's not just being a good Southern Baptist. He is teaching us his ways in Christ. Okay. Now to come into a mature son, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ is this process of you seeing not dimly, but starting dimly and going into full understanding. Okay. And you're going to find this. And if you think about it, maybe you've already experienced this. If you have ever turned it on for a season, maybe you did a season of fasting and prayer and you just isolated yourself and you just began to bear down and, and, and just operate in tongues, interceding by the spirit, pressing in, straining forward, bearing down towards a goal, whatever that goal was for you, right? Um, if you ever have done that and then you notice yourself get clearer, you start to have more understanding. You start to have actually, uh, you start to have knowings, which is the language of the spirit. When the spirit speaks, it's not a voice uh, necessarily. It's a knowing because he speaks, He his, the spirit's communication is to your spirit. Okay. And your, your mind translates your spirit. That's why your mind has to be renewed because we can't afford a translator 
who doesn't repeat things exactly the same. You know, um, I've heard people talk about this. They trust their translator and they find out after two or three days of teaching, that guy isn't repeating anything I say with any accuracy at all. (laughs) And that's what an unrenewed mind is. It's not perceiving what the spirit is speaking with any accuracy because it's flowing through the filter of, you know, your traditions and what you believe and all that. So when you are under the influence of the flesh, okay, when you're under the influence of the flesh and what is the flesh? It's not just moral things. We're talking about distractions. We're talking about cares of this world. We're talking about fear. We're talking about anxiety. Uh, we're talking about, you know, um, civilian life, as Paul talks about. We're talking about not being ensnared in the things of a civilian life. We're talking about um, things having to do with all that. That's all the things that want to be a weight upon you to prevent you from maturity. And what is maturity? Ultimately, it's it's the complete influence of the Spirit with nothing else added. You're under the influence of the Spirit only, right? You're under the influence of the Spirit only. Jesus was under the influence of the Spirit only. He was not under the influence of any man, of any tradition, of any circumstance. He was only under the influence of the Spirit of His Father. So, if revelation seems partial, if you are seen through a glass darkly, if you are like, You know, yesterday or last week or last month or last year, things were going great. And now I'm just like, you know, what the heck? I I can almost almost said something from my old life. I think I'll just keep that back in my back pocket, throw it away later. (laughs) But it would and it would have fit great. James, I'll tell you later. (laughs) If you're having difficulty moving forward or seeing or knowing and everything is veiled to you, it's because you you are under the influence of other things besides the spirit. And I'm just going to call those the flesh and knowing that it's not just things of morality that I'm talking about, although it could include that. So, you know, this includes if you're up and down, not steady, not constant, thrown around by your emotions, unable to control your mind, you, you, you have lost peace. You have stopped um, operating in power for some reason. You you stopped, you know, maybe your healing results have lessened. You're fearful, doubtful, timid. These are all things. These are all influences of the flesh. Now, the the one other argument that could come into play is, well, that could be under the influence of the devil. Right, you could, but the only thing the devil can influence is your flesh. (laughs) <laughs> See, if your flesh is dead, the devil has no hold. He has no influence. That's why those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, just a few verses later. Fourteen, fourteen, and 15. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15. Paul says, for if I pray in a tongue, okay, newsflash, he's still talking to the Corinthians about the same thing. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So when we pray in tongues or pray in the spirit, it is our spirit praying. And this is the only Uh, that I'm aware of, this is the only activity where your spirit, soul, and body participates in a uh, purely spirit action, okay? If I pray in a tongue, my mind, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful, meaning I don't understand the words I'm saying, okay? Verse 15, what am I to do? I I will, that's a good question. He's going to answer it. (laughs) What am I to do? Hold on, he's going to answer it. I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Okay, so I don't believe here, although, you know, you certainly could draw this conclusion that Paul 
is saying, I'll pray with, I'll pray in the spirit when I don't know what I'm saying, but I'm also going to include some words in English or whatever language it is so that I can pray with my mind. But I don't believe that's really truthfully what he's saying. When he says, I'm praying in the spirit uh, and my mind is unfruitful, what am I going to do? I'm going to pray in tongues expecting revelation knowledge to enter my mind. Okay. And um, if you're ever someone who has done this, spend ex spent extended periods of time praying in tongues, um, you'll notice that after a while, you'll begin to have revelation knowledge come to you. You'll start to know things. If you're praying about a specific situation, maybe a, a family member that's missing or you don't you, you haven't heard from him and you should have heard from him. What's going on? What's the situation? Are they actually in trouble? You know, you start to intercede. And I'm going to start using that word now instead of pray, because this is really what we're talking about. You start to intercede by the spirit and you will have knowing of the spirit concerning whatever it is that you're focused on while you're praying. If anybody speaks in tongues, he talks to God. He speaks mysteries to God is what Paul said. So, and we've, I maybe you probably heard these testimonies. I've heard tons of them where they're praying for a family member. And all of a sudden they realize that family member was in this specific location and they needed help of some kind. So they were able to go there and help them. I've heard tons and tons of stories like that. How, how what is that? Okay. God communicated through their praying in tongues to their spirit, which was interpreted in their mind as understanding or as knowing. Okay. And we should expect when we pray in tongues or when we intercede in the spirit, because what are we doing? And I'll, I'll add the missing piece here in a second. We are moving towards maturity. What is maturity to come under the influence of the spirit only? Maturity is not a degree where you studied all the Bible verses. <laughs> you can know, you can quote the Bible front to back and still be under the influence of everything else uh, except the Spirit. Matthew, you joined twice. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> Technology. All right, so... Maturity is coming under the influence of the spirit only. So maturity is not as much about, um, it, well, let's say it like this. It's not only about gaining understanding. It is about putting away every other influence, which is huge. And if you've ever contended for a breakthrough for yourself or healing for yourself, you, you realize by experience that when you actually receive by faith, the thing that you're you've been contending for and it manifests, um, you you realize that at that moment when you actually received it was when you put every other influence away and you had one focus, one goal, one desire to apprehend this thing and and hold it until it it does the job, right? Whether that's healing or whatever. It's the putting away of all other influences. Uh, Jesus talked about this in Matthew 7 when he talked about having a single eye. And we teach that in a training cycle. I'm not going to go into it now because I'm trying to talk about tongues and putting away the flesh so that you can have fuller and fuller understanding, so that you can have fuller and fuller operation of the Spirit through you. Okay? So I'm going to go to Romans 8, 2 and just, and just kind of jump through, skip over verses and just jump through here and, and kind of... Um, pull together some thoughts and ideas. This is Romans 8, 2. Paul says this, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Okay, that's positional. That's positional. Okay, you're going to have to work this out. But I, you have to understand that the, the law, that the Spirit of life is a law in you, and this law puts to death everything that's earthly. Sin and death are earthly. They're not in heaven. Okay? This is a law. This is a force. This is a force of God that puts away the influence of sin, death, and all of its effects. Okay? Verse 5. 
Talking about intercession in the spirit, praying in tongues. Verse 5, for those who live, for those who live according to the flesh. How are they living according to the flesh? They set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live, those who live according to the spirit. How do you live according to the spirit? You set your mind on the things of the spirit. Okay? So if you're going to live according to your flesh, you are setting your mind on earthly things, cares, distractions, fears, anxieties, weights, problems, okay? You're going to live, listen, you can pray in tongues and live according to the flesh all day long, okay? But those who set their minds on the things of the Spirit are living by the Spirit, okay? Uh, I'm going to jump to verse 10, just stringing some thoughts together here about the law of the spirit of life. But if Christ is in you, and this is the Christ that transforms you, not the Christ that's outside of you somewhere, it's the Christ that is in you. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay. How is the spirit Life, because of righteousness, because of Christ's righteousness, obviously, but you're going to have to awaken to righteousness in order to feel the, I say feel, in order to experience the impact of the spirit of life in you. When you awaken to righteousness, what is awakening to righteousness? That means you're putting away every other influence that's unrighteous. You're putting away every other influence that's not of the Spirit, and you awaken to pleasing God in every area of your life, then you're going to find yourself empowered by a life that comes from the Spirit. Verse 11, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also Give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So there is a very real correlation between the spirit in you, the spirit just being in you, and the spirit giving life to you. The spirit can be in you, but if you have your mind, if you are living according to the mindset of the flesh, you have your mind on earthly things. Uh, You have the spirit in you, but you're not receiving, you're not being benefited by the power of that life. Okay. When you choose to set your mind on the spirit, when you choose to awaken to righteousness, when you choose to bring yourself into order and bear down on this finish line we've been talking about, that act begins to cause life to permeate your entire being. Okay? I'm going to jump to verse 12. So then, brothers, <laughs> so then, having said these things, so then, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. What is the flesh? You set your mind, uh, your, you set your mind on the things of this world. You have your mindset on temporal things. Or in other words, you don't have your mind set on the spirit only. Okay? That's living according to the flesh. Uh, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Okay? How do we put to death the deeds of the body? How do we put away... The, the the influence of the carnal nature, natural desires that cause us to see things dimly, to do things dimly, to, to lack understanding, revelation, and ability that c- keeps us as immature children. We put it to death by the Spirit. Okay? Oh, how do we do that? We must, we need to have a soaking party and let's just turn on the music and soak right i mean hey that's fine i do my fair share of silence before the lord 
but that's not uh, Paul's recommendation, as we'll see. And then it goes on to say, uh, nah, I'm not going to read that part. Those who are led by the Spirit of the sons of God, that's what that is in context, and we always talk about that. Verse 22, you're going to put to death the flesh, the veil, the dim thing, the thing that causes the light to dim, the revelation to dim, the ability, the ability to dim out. You're going to put that to death by the Spirit. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation, okay, this is just one long teaching here from Paul about living by the Spirit and coming into maturity. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth till now. This is how we're going to put to death the flesh by the Spirit. What's the Spirit doing? Groaning. We know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth till now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, meaning the baptism of the Holy Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption. Remember, I talked about that uh, as sons. One translation says adoption as mature sons, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, so this groaning that Paul is talking about, this is putting to death the things of the flesh, the deeds of the body, by the Spirit. Okay, in context now, this groaning is for a production of a mature man. For the creation, let's see, where am I? 22, 23, let's jump to 26. Likewise. <laughs> so he goes on and talks a little bit about we don't know how to pray when we want to. When we want to pray, we don't know how to pray. What's that? Praying dimly. <laughs> we need to pray. What, how are we going to pray? I don't know. Why? Because you're praying, you have dim knowledge. You're dealing with limited knowledge. This is why we have the Spirit, not only so that we can make up for our lack of understanding, our lack of knowledge, but also so that we can bring ourselves into a full, clear reflection, the fullness of knowledge. Okay? Verse 26 Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. How does He help us? For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Okay? Now, this Spirit that God put in us is to what? Lead us into what? All truth. Right? So, it's not... It's not enough that the Spirit give you some truth when you need it. The Spirit is here to bring you into maturity, which is having all truth. Does that make sense? What is the avenue by which the Spirit is producing uh, this maturity? What is the avenue by which the Spirit is working, interceding through us for this maturity? And by the way, just a few verses later is when it says all creation is groaning for the manifestation of the glorious sons of God. That's the mature son. How is the spirit bringing us into all knowledge? How is the spirit putting to death every other influence that's not of him? It's through the intercession of the spirit. And in here, he talks about groanings. Okay. But what we are talking about is the activity of the spirit which is like giving birth. And that's the picture he's painting here in Romans 8. What are we giving birth to? What are we being conformed into? The Conformed into his image. What is his image? His image is of that of a full-grown son, a mature son. Now let's go to Jude 120 and 21, and we'll end here. End back where we started. Jude 1, 20 and 21. <clears throat> so if the Spirit is, is interceding through us for us, the expected result of that intercession is full knowledge. 
is full understanding. It's not seeing things dimly or inaccurately or partially. It's having full view. It's having full understanding. It's operating in full ability. Okay? How is the Spirit doing this again? Through through these groans that are deep within us. And these groans, if you ever prayed in tongues and prayed it, really prayed in the Spirit and not just making sounds, then you'll sense uh, an, a push. You'll sense a, uh, a giving birth or breaking through or, you know, like, um, oh, there's many pictures you could paint. Like when you drop your bucket in the well and you get it full of water and you start to pull it back up, there's some weight to it. That's because there's stuff in it. And you can sense that when you're praying in tongues, that you're starting to get into, uh, you're starting to change things or bring things to bear or cause things to be communicated to you from God that are going to cause you to be built up into a, a, a bigger stature. Okay. And that's what he says here in Jude 1. But beloved, but you beloved, building yourselves up. Well, that seems to go right along with the goal, the finish line, growing up into him in every way, into the measure of the stature of his fullness, uh, building yourselves up so that there's nothing lacking, right? Knowledge will pass away. Tongues will pass away. All of these things, these partial things, these things that are in place so that we can have understanding while, while we're still maturing. You know, that's really what a gift is. A gift is an operation when you're not walking in fullness. It's helping you. It's making up for where you're dim. <laughs> oh, the jokes that we could tell there, dim. So, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So praying in tongues is a mind set on the Spirit where God is using that intercession. Okay, and this could be for others or other situations, but we're just talking kind of about you right now. You coming into fullness of understanding, you having knowledge, understanding, wisdom, revelation, and functioning in the ability of Jesus Christ, growing up into Him in every way, one of the most critical methods by which this happens, uh, let's just say this, this is the only method by which this is possible by the Spirit in you. Okay? How does the Spirit operate to bring these things to pass? You know, does He just in there sloshing around like the Holy Ghost is in there and, you know, who knows what He's doing in there and we never really have any real participation. We just believe He's in there because the Bible says He is, you know? No. We are one spirit with the Lord. He who joins himself to the Lord is made one spirit. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Now, that new man, which is in the image of Jesus Christ, that's your spirit. And we're trying to bring the rest of your man into being conformed into that same fullness. That man, that perfect man, that fullness of God that's dwelling inside of you, is interceding through you for you when you pray in tongues. Especially when you have a mindset on the Spirit. When you have pushed away and brought a focus to your mind, the, the picture from Paul is still good, a woman in childbirth, like what's she doing? She's got one goal, and she's focused. Haley told me when she was giving birth to one of our kids, or maybe all of them, that she had to focus on a point on the wall in order to get through it, right? She was focused on giving birth, on producing life. And that is what praying in the Spirit is, intercession of the Spirit, is bringing you into a brighter day in Him. And there's a verse, and I have tried to quote it on here a few times, but the the path of the righteous is like um, the new is like the sun 
sh- shining unto full brightness at noonday or something like that. You guys know that verse? You ever heard that verse? <clears throat> Somebody looked that up. All you Bible scholars that looked that guy up before, looked that one up. The path of the righteous is like um, the brightness of the sun unto the full light of day or something. Okay, that's how this works. What's the means by which it works? It is it is your joint participation in a mindset on the spirit in conjunction with intercession of the spirit through you for you. Now, it's not in it, Paul said, again, my mind is unfruitful, but his intention is that it not stay unfruitful because this is maturity coming into understanding, coming into knowledge, coming into fruitfulness, coming into ability. He says, remember, he said, what shall I do? I shall pray in the spirit and I shall pray with my mind. So we should expect as part of this process uh, to not only pray in the spirit, but as you pray in the spirit, not a knowledge transfer is passed to your mind. Understanding is passed to your mind. Revelation is passed to your mind. And all of these things together, as he says in Jude 120, they are building you up in faith. Or as it says, on or in, yeah, in your most holy faith. I mean, there's another recipe for for a full-grown son. That is someone where there's no competition with believing. They have only set their mind on what the word says and settled it that is true and refuses to rehearse any other scenario. Besides the outcome, the word promises. That's what faith is. So, this is uh, this is the little book in here that I think is so cool. Do you remember how we talked about in First Corinthians thirteen that there's a um, that there is a connection between love uh, being um, influenced by love, being filled with love, and praying in the spirit. You have to go back and listen to that where I, where I talked about that. But verse 21, it comes up again. Praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So there's a connection with maturity, love, revelation, understanding, and speaking in tongues through the intercession of the Spirit. There's a connection to all of these things. And a lot like when people are struggling, my advice is always the same. Use tongues as a weapon until all of these other things that are competing with your spirit are removed. And if you're going through a, a dim time or you're going through a time where it's like, whoa, what happened? Somebody turned the lights out. You know, I was doing good and now the lights are out. Okay. You're just under the influence of something darkly called your flesh. It's a veil. We, how do we know it's a veil? Because um, it says that we pass through the veil of Christ's flesh when he was crucified. Flesh is a veil. Okay, it shrouds. It's darkened. It's, it's a darkened nature and darkened understanding. See, you when you get your immortal body, the idea, God's idea is, his, his preference is, that when you switch from your mortal to your immortal body, that it's, it's just seamless. You just slip from mortality to immortality. For some people, they're going to be like, when they slip to the immortal body, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm so free. What just happened? <laughs> well, you've been carrying around that dead body your whole life trying to be spiritual. <laughs> but I guarantee you, if you will sequester yourself and pray in tongues as if you're giving birth and refuse to quit until you get a breakthrough that you've never had, you will push away the influences that are darkening your mind, the influences that are darkening your understanding, the influences that are preventing you from operating in the spirit. Okay? If you want to live in the Spirit, you must set your mind on the Spirit and participate in the intercession of the Spirit by praying in tongues 
letting the Spirit intercede through you for you until you come into greater knowledge, greater revelation, greater understanding, and greater ability. This is why, and I left it out. Um, this is why when we see Paul talking about praying in tongues, he says, pray at all times. Praying, and that's in Galatians, I believe. Praying at all times. So, Paul again is teaching his ways. Why? Because he wants to bring people into what he is. What is Paul coming into? The image of Christ, a mature son, unto a place of spiritual maturity beyond which there is no progress. And let me tell you, you can heap up for yourself so much life of the Spirit, so much influence of the Spirit, building yourself up under the influence of the weight of this love by praying in tongues, that you will put away the weight of the flesh and that sets you free from every care of this world and demonic things. Do you hear me? You can pray in tongues and build yourself up in the spirit and in love and in fullness and in understanding and in revelation until it becomes a weight that pushes away the influence of the flesh. I have, I found all these things out by accident, by sequestering myself and praying for a breakthrough that I didn't know if I could have or not. And I discovered, I began to discover what is life, what is what it's like, what it could be like to walk unimpeded by the flesh, unimpeded by the flesh that causes us to see dimly, to know dimly, to experience dimly, and to walk dimly. What would it be like if you could say like Paul, I no longer live? That's just not a pretty statement. This is the guy who said, pray in the Spirit at all times. Do you suppose he discovered something, a way of Christ into maturity, a way of Christ into a place where there's no other competing influences with the Spirit of God? <clears throat> in your life? Yes, wholeheartedly, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, when I talked about earlier, you know, we have to talk about not just Bible verses, we have to talk about ways in Christ. We have to talk about ways into maturity. We have to see it in Paul and Peter and the others. We have to see it in the Word of God, and then we have to make every effort. Listen, if you could avail yourself to a lifestyle that was like giving birth by intercession in the Spirit, if you could just give up a week of your life, seven days in a row, it wouldn't take seven days probably, but if you could give up your week, a week of your life for that one purpose, you would explode in knowledge, revelation, ability, and power. You would become a completely new person. I know, because it happened to me. <laughs> it happened to me. Haley keeps saying when you got saved, you know, like four years ago. <laughs> okay, that's what happened to all of us. It leaked into my family. But you can crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Listen, that doesn't, that's, that's not just talking about immorality. We're talking about things. We're talking about desires that compete with awakening to righteousness. Desires that compete with obedience. Desires that compete with a mindset on the spirit. To be able to put them away once and for all. All right. I hope that made sense to you. Questions, comments, or thoughts, things you want to add that I didn't say that would be helpful. 
What do you got? It's some of the hardest work you'll ever do, by the way. <laughs> Man, it's like digging a grave. Hard at first, but you give way to the ease of the spirit. You know, what you, if you put away the flesh with its passions and desires through this process, you will enter the rest of the spirit. You will enter his rest. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. So did you say in Colossians it said to pray in the spirit all times too? It also says? Uh, I'll look it up for you. Um, that's Ephesians 6.18. After he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And then he tells you to put on God's armor. And then he says, pray in the spirit at all times. But we can't underestimate this intercession of the spirit. Because, see, what we do is we we judge its effectiveness by our experience in the past uh, i i've i have prayed in tongues before i you know i prayed for like 15 or 20 minutes you know and you know okay it did some good i guess okay that's that's quite a bit short of 24 7 like paul said let's let's practice that let's bear down on breakthrough there Let's bear down on revelation, knowledge, and maturity, and revelation, knowledge, and understanding there with that method and pursue in it, persist in it until we arise into a, you know, a more mature state. You know, what, if you, Paul said this in another, in another place, in another way, he said, set aside every sin and weight that so easily besets you. What's he talking about? Weights. He's talking about things that your flesh likes that slow you down. That is an influence on a mind that's set on the spirit only. And, and really everything that Paul's talking about is you putting away what competes for a mindset on the spirit. Because if you can get that focused mind on the spirit only and get a strong mind and participate in the spirit, which is this praying in the tongues, Intercession in tongues, like I talked about, that is that is going to aid you and exponentially increase your growth. Okay. Is there things that you don't understand that I said? Is there stuff that's not clicking or are you like getting it? Yes. Yes, Haley. <laughs> well, I raised my hand before, but you didn't see it. Oh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> so I just was sitting here thinking about the, um, the fact that we so easily fall into really a carnal mind or a fleshly mindset. It's like our default. So I think it's hard sometimes for people to catch when it happens. But if you can note some things that are fleshly, and like I said, like you said, it doesn't necessarily mean like sinful things that we're... Morality. Yeah, the morality things listed in the Bible. It's things like you know, our, our flesh is what likes drama. Um, our flesh is what gets frustrated and like, like unfocused. Wants to focus on the problem. Distracted. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it likes to rehearse the problem. Mm -hmm. Your flesh is the part of you that's a quitter mm -hmm. that will start. And then, oh, you know, my, my flesh is the thing that exercises seven <coughs> days in a row and then takes 14 days off right? Okay. Those things are flesh. And so if I can think about that, 
then if I can catch that what as it starts to happen, then I can use praying in tongues almost as like a slap back of like, nope, I'm not like, and refocus myself and then, then pray in the spirit and be like, allow my, be disciplined in, in telling my flesh, you are not the main attraction here. You are not driving this car but the spirit is yeah those those are just right. thoughts that i was having because because that, that's i think we spend a, most people christians most christians spend basically 24 7 ruled by the nature of the flesh yeah in their mind without even and they're really nice great people who mm -hmm. love jesus but mm -hmm. they just don't realize that yeah yeah so there's, uh, as you're talking, I came up with some new words to describe it. And this is what I found out when I sequestered myself and gave birth, started giving birth. Uh, I had never experienced this. I experienced a buoyancy in the spirit that I'd never, I didn't even know we could have. I didn't know it was available. And it is wild. It, the, it is a freedom that never even entered my mind was possible. And, um, you know, you you see the effects of that, although you look at me and you're like, well, he's just like a normal person with a little whatever. <laughs> but listen, I've only been like this for like four or five years because I found a, there was a buoyancy that happened that lifted me up out. It lifted me out. And that seems like a good way to say it. And anybody can do this. Anybody can pray in tongues. Anybody can bring focus to their mind. Anybody can decide as an act of their will to focus and bear down until they come to a place of breakthrough where they've never been before. And the knowledge of God, uh, this is what we're after. We're after a fullness of knowledge. We're after uh, wisdom and understanding. We're after revelation. We're after functioning ability uh all of these things build up on top of each other that's why it says in jude building yourself up in like there's a constant building up in there's a constant increase of buoyancy like uh we watched that movie the other night that had the people that rode the hot air balloon and there's things that they did to increase the lift of their balloon into the air, you know, they, and one of them was they got rid of the weight. <laughs> they got rid of the weight in the basket. They started throwing stuff overboard when they needed to climb. They had sandbags and things. So uh, this is, this is like the main thing that I really just want for you guys through all this teaching and things. Cause everybody, I, I could see people when they're seen through a glass darkly, because they're shrouded, and to me, they're lost in a in a dimness that I can see clearly. What? Because I'm not in it with them. Really, I just want you guys to achieve this kind of a breakthrough, and if you would, um, it, like I was telling Deb the other day, uh, contending for healing. I said, don't get drawn into long periods where you wear yourself out of praying, praying, praying. Pray very, it's very, it's more beneficial to pray intensely for 30 minutes and then recoup, relax, and then go again and keep that up all day long and just increase in the strength of that instead of like trying to have some kind of marathon thing where you just collapse in pure exhaustion, you know, uh, because what we're after here is, is, is the experience, the experiential reality of when the spirit causes this life to come into you. It's so powerful. I, I so wish, talk about being frustrated. I so wish I could just give myself to this. I so wish. That's why I get up early. Not because I'm. it's more spiritual, because that's the only time I have to give myself to it. Yeah. Deb. Um. I know people and I have, I mean, I could say, um, I pray, 
Um, I pray. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who described them as popcorn prayers, little one and two sentence things, you know, I pray, I, I pray all the time, not, but, but there is, and those are not bad things. It's not a bad thing to have an ongoing conversation with Jesus throughout the day, but there is something distinctively transforming about more sustained periods of prayer. And, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm really good at it. I'm saying that because when I have managed to do a 30 minute block of prayer, there's a difference when it's over, when that 30 minutes is over. Um, and it takes, and that's where the flesh you know, says, oh, you're hungry or, you know, it, it, you have this other thing you need to do. Um, it's a choice <coughs> that we make. <coughs> That's right. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. And um, I'll just tack on to that. If, you begin to get good at this. You, you know, like the first time, you know, why do we see a trail in the woods? It's because animals have gone over that trail over and over and over and over. Right. And if you, most people are, are, are like um, what Paul describes immature Christians in Ephesians four, they're being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, every wave, everything. Um, you know, if you begin to mature, you're not going to be tossed around. You're going to have a solid path. And if you know how to pray in a way, if you know how to intercede in the spirit in a way that brings results, like Deb was talking about, you can repeat the process. If you make the path down once and you're like, Hey, that, that was powerful and led to breakthrough. Keep going down that path, you know, and, and get skilled at it. To where, you know, where you used to have to pray 30 minutes for a breakthrough. Now you can just put in five or eight minutes because you know the intensity and the focus that it takes to achieve the, the end result. And that is and the, the goal then is that you not just have a, a period where you pray and get that breakthrough and then what? Sink back into the influence of the flesh and then you have to go and pray again. The point is that you achieve what I call that buoyancy where you come up and you stay up, you stay elevated, you stay in the spirit where you begin to walk in that. And up until four or five years ago, I have never experienced that, but I, but I, I have now. And so my whole goal now is to grow and excel in that and, and, and build upon the fullness, you know, just build upon the fullness more and more and more and more and more understanding, walking in it, operating in it, uh, you know, to, to walk in the spirit and to be illuminated as Paul talks about, it is, it is completely otherworldly and, and you will have experiences and live a life that you didn't know was available. So I hope that encourages everybody to go do that. Um, this is the advice I give people when they're stuck. But this is my this is Paul's way in Christ. This is my way I've adopted from Paul, and it works. So I plead with you to do the work. I plead with you to do the work. This is this is what you need. You have to, you can't, you can't just be a monk though, praying tongues. Like even the monks, man, they had incredible encounters and experiences and translated and all over the place. Why? Because they gave themselves to this type of stuff. Maybe they didn't speak in tongues, but they had, they had the spirit of God if they're doing things of the spirit, right? So I plead with you to set aside the time to sequester yourself, to cut down the schedule, to do whatever you got to do, to dive, to dive into this and to give birth and to, um, Begin to live a life in the spirit where your mind is set on the spirit and you're not constantly drug around 
by the cares of this world and your circumstances and the thoughts of your minds. You can have it. Jesus wants you to have it. That's why he gave you his spirit. All right, Father, we thank you for the spirit, the gift, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, who is not only capable, but will lead us into all truth and even into the fullness of Christ, which is what all truth is, the fullness of Christ, the measure of the stature of his fullness, manifesting Christ in every way through our life. But this, Father, this is a process that does not come uh, without our diligent participation and a decision that we are going to cross the finish line. We say yes to the finish line and we will adjust ourselves to cross it uh, and cross it well, cross it as a mature man and able to lead others into maturity also. Father, show us what has been lost from the early church. Show us the ways that have been shrouded that we cannot see because we have been stuck seeing dimly. Show us these ways, reveal these ways so that we can walk in them like Paul and Peter and the others, Stephen. Show us these ways so that we can teach others in these ways, lead others in these ways until we can restore until we can restore what's been lost, what's been stolen, what's been shrouded, what has been veiled from us because of other influences in Jesus' name. Go get it. Live a new life now. Live a new life. All right, gang. Thanks for joining. We'll see you this weekend or we'll see you next week or whenever we see you. Bye-bye.